Hi internet friends, my name is John and welcome to episode 9 in my series of how to create a website using a Baco V8. In this video I'm going to be walking you through how to set up dependency injection with Mbaco V8. So I'll be showing you how to register some custom types, we'll be talking about the different lifecycle scopes and we'll be talking about guards. Now if you're playing along at home and to make your life easier you can go over to my github there's a starter kit which is the accompaniment to this series it's called the John D. Jones V8 sample kit original I know. If you like this content and you'd like to see more of this series don't forget to be a legend and hit that subscribe button now. The purpose of this video is to explain how dependency injection works within V8. This is not an introduction into dependency injection. If you want one of those, I recommend reading this book that you can see on screen. It's by a guy called Mark Seaman, hence the very funny cartoon. I bet that guy's never heard that in his life. But yeah, go over to Amazon, check it out. I'm not an affiliate, but I recommend reading it. There are literally tons and tons of inversion of control frameworks for .NET. There's things like Structure Map, Castle Windsor. Now, Umbraco V8 uses a dependency injection framework called Light Inject. Now, Light Inject probably isn't used as much as some of the other ones. However, it is one of the fastest. Now, when you're installing V8, Light Inject will automatically get installed for you. So you won't actually have to do anything. So as you can see in my package.config, I have these five packages. I haven't installed them. They just came automatically with Umbraco. And through the use of the initial and core composers, Umbraco actually registers all its services with Light Inject on boot up. So you don't actually have to do anything. Let me start off by showing you how super simple it is to use dependency injection with the Umbraco core services. Now on the screen in front of you, you can see that I have this controller. I haven't done any special configuration. All I've done is set this up. It's a render MVC controller and I'm passing in this iAmbraco context factory. Now, if I go back to my website, hit refresh, what you can see is through the magic of dependency injection, iAmbraco context factory has been populated. So I don't need to worry about anything. All I need to do is just set this up and in the background and Braco will do everything for me. Now I could also set up some custom dependencies. So let's talk about that one. So as you can see I've now got this shared partial controller and in here I'm passing this iSite pages. So this is something I've created, it doesn't really make a difference what it does. So if I go to go to information, what you can see is just a class. It's got some methods in it. I'm again passing in dependency injection here, but we didn't care about this. I'm also implementing this interface. So if I have a quick peek of it, it's just an interface, nothing special with some public properties. So to enable dependency injection with your own custom dependencies like this, you need to register them. And this is done using a user composer, as you can see here. So we've got register dependencies. It's implementing the compose method. I talked about this in the previous video. And then in here, we have this register. So to enable dependency injection with your custom types, you first start off doing register, you define your interface, you then define your concrete type, and then you put this lifetime scope in here. Now I'll talk about that in a minute, but this is basically all you need. Now, if I go back to my website, and if I say go back and attach a breakpoint, that would probably be useful. There we go. And then if I hit this endpoint, as you can see, I've now got a valid instance and I have my dependency automatically populated. And this is, this is basically all you need to do for Mbaco dependency injection. Super simple, it's all configured for you. Let's now consider the more interesting question of scope. Now, every single dependency injection framework comes with different scopes. They're roughly all the same. Light inject comes with four. So as you can see, we're passing in this enum and we have scope, we have request, we have transient and we have single. And each one does slightly different things. So I've created this very simple example to try and hopefully demonstrate to you how it works. So I've created four classes and the four classes, all they're doing is within the constructor generating ID. So we're creating a new GUID in each constructor. So as you can see, we have the scopes, we have transient, we have singleton and we have request. They're all exactly the same. Now I've also created this controller and what I'm doing is passing in two of each type so hopefully we can see the differences between them. So now when I scroll over transient, you can see that transient has a new ID starting with 59. And then if we go through transient one, you can see that the ID is different. And this is what transient is. So for each and every request, it will generate a new instance within the container. So if you think about it, Umbraco has one container and that's the light injection, the light inject container, sorry. 
and every single time a request is made for any of these dependencies, Light Inject will create a new one. Now this is by far the easiest type of request to use and it's one that I recommend you use pretty much all the time. It probably isn't as memory efficient as it could be. However, don't worry about premature optimization. Just go for this one. And if you really do have a problem with it, you know, try and configure it later on. But for ease of use, this is the best way to go. Now let's have a look at scopes. So scopes, we've got an ID of 2286. And the second one is also 2286. And this is because with scopes, we're sharing resources. So we're making one request and with a scoped request, what we're saying is we want to share that same instance of the object for the request. Now, singleton is probably going to be a bit more easy to understand. With a singleton, when the container starts up, as soon as anything makes a request for that dependency, it's going to use that one instance. It's not going to create any more. It's going to be shared over the entire lifecycle of the application. So not per request, per application. So if you're doing things like caching or logging, this is where you want to use this, this singleton scope. So as you can see here, we've got 91 and 91. So they're exactly the same. And the final request is the request type. And request type is it will generate a new instance per request. So in here, because we're passing in request example and request example in two different requests, what will happen is we have an ID of C72 and we'll also have the request example ID of CD77. So these two eyes are different. And this is because we're making two different requests so as you can see, how you use that lifetime scope will actually affect how your code will work. And in this example, essentially, I would always recommend you using the transient, but it could lead to some nuanced bugs. So for example, say you have a singleton, which has a dependency being injected into it as a transient. In essence, because the singleton will always generate one instance, the transient being passed into it will actually always be a singleton as well. And this is something to be wary of from my own experience creating APIs and stuff, you can actually get a load of really nuanced bugs. So when you're actually creating all this stuff, you want to make sure that any um, child dependencies you inject in should have the same matching dependency scope as the request that you're using. So basically, in layman's term, always use transient. It'll make your life much easier. If you don't use transient, you can get some really weird, odd bugs, which are really, really super difficult to debug, and it will make you pull your hair out. Surprisingly, that is actually everything you need to know in order to get up and running with dependency injection with Umbraco V8. Now, historically, if I tried to do one of these videos within V7, it would have probably been about 20 minutes long because there was a number of steps, hoops, and unexpected surprises that you'd encounter. Now, because Light Inject does come with Umbraco, it means that you no longer have to worry about registering the Umbraco services yourself. And through the use of user composers, you can see that it's super simple to register your own custom dependencies. So there's no excuse for not using it. The only thing that you really need to be mindful of is the lifetime scope. And as I said, just use transient for everything and you will be golden. As mentioned at the start of this video, this is episode nine in my series of how to build a website using Umbraco V8. If you enjoy this content and you'd like to learn more, then please hit that subscribe button. I would very much appreciate it. I've also written a book about Mbako V8, so if you want to learn about Mbako in a slightly different way, you can head over to Lean Pub. It's called Mbako Secrets Exposed. It's only $9.99, it's a work in progress. However, all the content you see on this video and a ton more are in that book, so it will help you learn Mbako inside out. Finally, if you want to do me a solid, um, you can hit the like button, it will help other people view it. Also, don't forget to download the accompanying starter kit, which comes with this video. It's on my GitHub, link below. Otherwise, I hope you have an amazing day. Happy coding!